All right, so we're here ready for our third session. And uh, I'm really excited that you're lasted this long. Maybe I've bored you to tears over our historical study about how we got the Bible in the form that it's in today. You've been waiting all along, some of you, for me to tell you what's the best translation of the Bible. Huh. Well, I'm not going to make it that easy for you. I'm going to make you suffer the next 50 minutes or so before we get to there. And so if you were to actually come to me and ask me, how am I supposed to read the Bible? What Bible should I read? And I would tell you, well, you know what? You should read it in the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. <laughs> there you go. You know, like, but I can't read it in the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Aramaic. I want to read it. What translation is the best translation? Which one is the accurate translation? Well, this is important. All translations are interpretations. And every interpretation takes us one step from the original. So no translation is going to be 100% accurate. There is not going to be the best translation. I do have one that I prefer. Again, momentarily, I am going to tell you why. But let's take a look at this, do a little review here. Um, if you remember in a quick review, we actually had folks, ooh, I'm missing some things here. Oh, there we go. We have a little bit about the original text. Um, do you remember we talked in our first session a couple of weeks ago that the Masoretic text is the Hebrew text that we use to translate uh, the Old Testament of the Bible. All translators use this. There's 100% agreement on this. There is no other option. Now, the Greek text, we have two current and competing versions of the Greek text. The text is Receptus, and that's the one that's used by the King James. I believe it's used by other translations, too, throughout the world. But most contemporary translations um, use a different version. So again, the King James heavily influenced this version. So this is, this is uh, the Texas Receptus was actually something different than what the King James Version used. It was actually uh, the, the, the version that Theodore Beza wrote. But the King James Committee so influenced uh, our understanding of, 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 of the Greek text that it became their copy which is not completely the same as Theodore Beza's, but it became the Textus Receptus, and that's what it's called today. I believe that this Textus Receptus, this is important, is a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. You want to turn it off right there and continue to go read your King James Version of the Bible? God bless you. You're my brother, you're my sister in Christ. Good for you. It is a faithful witness. To Jesus. I'm all jiggy with it. I know I shouldn't say that, right? A friend of mine gets really upset with me, but hey, it's the immortal Will Smith, for goodness sakes. Let's go on. There's the other one, the Novum Testamentum Grece, or the United Bible Society version. It is now in its 28th edition, and it is also a compiled text. Again, this isn't the original. This isn't the original. It was written by the, the, uh, the original authors. They're compiled texts where they take multiple Greek texts. In this case, it uses the Latin Vulgate as well. In this text case, it uses only Greek texts. And we try to find as close to the original we can based on certain arguments and historical arguments and textual arguments. Most contemporary translations are based upon the Novum Testamentum Grece. Oh, look at this. It is a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. I know, these folks, their heads are going to explode. I'm sorry. But I have no disrespect for the Textus Receptus. I prefer this. I think it's a better Greek text than this. But I still think you could find Jesus if this is all you got. The same thing I would reverse and please encourage the King James only folks. This is also a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And you will find Jesus reading this just as clearly and easy, as easily as if you were to see him here. Let's go on. So which variant of the New Testament should I be using? Um, which New Testament will you, will you use to translate the New Testament? And as I said, the best thing is, if, if, if we could use the original Greek text, that would be awesome. But they don't exist, okay? 
So we have to create a, a Greek text, which is what the early church, or which the, uh, the early church, you know, one argument, let me, let me go back, because I'm not being clear with this. So which variant of the uh, Greek text should we use? Again, some would argue the originals. Well, they don't exist. Well, then we should use the church Greek text that the early church used. Well, which early church? And use where? In Constantinople, in Alexandria, Rome, these texts continue to change over the years, too. There are multiple competing Greek texts. They all disagreed. So who knows what the original were? You know, nobody knows what the, uh, what the early Christians were using. Um, use the Greek text that the early reformers were using. Well, even the reformers knew that their Greek text was crappy. It wasn't good. They didn't trust it. They were the ones who set us on the path of trying to, to formalize or better understand the Greek Testament and pull all these different texts together and find out what, uh, through argumentation which one is closest to the original. They didn't believe they had a finalized version. That's what I don't understand about the King James only version, folks. The King James Committee did not believe that they're creating a once and for all finalized copy of the Greek Testament. They were just doing the best they could with the information they had, and if other information had come to light, I'm sure they would have been grateful for it. That's the scary thing about thinking as though we've got the finalized copy of the Bible. It's a work in progress as we continue to strive and discover. It's exciting to me. I know there's some people who say, well, but that means the Bible's changing. Well, God is always faithful. No matter which version of the Bible we are using to accurately communicate to us a relationship with Christ. Yeah, there are differences. But your faith is not in jeopardy. Please put yourself at ease. Take a deep breath. Our Bible did come to us through a messy process as we learned the other week. However, I believe this is so impressive. You know, there's some Christians who still want to believe that the Bible's dropped from heaven on a golden platter and Jesus just spoke into their ears and they just wrote exactly what they heard and we, it was passed on to us. Well, historically, we know that's just not true. That's not how it happened. But what would be more impressive? God dropping on a golden platter to us, or a messy book filled with all the human frailties that are, are uh, typical of us humans, but yet one which through which God speaks clearly to us. Oh, I'm taking this one. Because I'd like to believe as a messy human being that God still speaks through me. And so I'm very grateful for a messy book where God can speak clearly to me. God takes messy people and a messy process and amazingly speaks the word of God. Jesus didn't come without a human body. Jesus came as a human being. God takes what is messy and does something spectacular with it. God took a mess of a man, Abraham and David and Moses and did spectacular things through them. God always took the lesser, the least, the messiest, and does something spectacular with it. I'm going with this book, the messy, frail book that seems to be all over the place, but yet despite all of the human frailties, God is accurately witnessed to. Oh, that's the book I'm taking. I'm not taking this one, because this, this book, this book is the book of totalitarians who want to tell you what to believe. This is the book of scribes and Pharisees. This is the book of this Holy Spirit. That's what I'm going with, baby. That's what I'm going with. Let's go on. So this is actually, <laughs> you like that? Uh, this is actually a real-to-life meme that I saw on Facebook. God's truth, the only truth, the King James Version, the authorized version of the Bible, or Satan's lies, the New King James, even, they don't even like the New King James Version, the NIV, the New American Standard. I, you know, this is the most absurd thing. This is such a bad witness to non-Christians. 
I mean, here we are, we're fighting each other. And you're going to hell. You're going, no, you're going, you're wrong, you're wrong. And the non Christians are saying, this is why I'm not a Christian. You guys are so stupid. We Christians can be so stupid. We do such damage to the witness of Christ because we argue about things. And, and the King James folks, they argue about things they're so ignorant of. They don't even understand it. Oh, my goodness, I know. Some of you are mad at me. So here are some silly arguments that the King James only folks use. Again, I want to clarify this before I go into this. I am not against the King James Version of the Bible. It is a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. King James onlyism is Pharisaism. It is a disrespect to Jesus Christ. It is destructive to Christianity. Here are some silly arguments by King James onlyism people. Again, another true meme. <laughs> by King James only guy about how all these flip, they're all going to hell because they're reading something other than King James. Oh my. Here's a silly argument. We already went through this last week. This is one of the arguments that you'll see by these guys who uh, are living in their parents' home still and are taking up the King James Version of the Bible and comparing it to another kind translation say, oh, look at the differences. They don't understand Greek, they don't understand Hebrew, they don't understand the process by which it is transmitted to us. They're jumping to conclusions out of their absolute, utter ignorance. And so they say, well, see, look, there's a passage missing out of here. This person, this is all liberal translation. These folks are going to hell because they actually edited the Bible. Oh my goodness. So one of the arguments you hear by these so-called King James only folks who think they know what they're talking about. They know this much information. Okay? They know this, this much. If only they knew all of it, they might change their mind. They say, well, the King James uses, uses the Byzantine text, which is the majority reading. We went through that last time, so I'm not going to go rehash that. That's just such a, it's such a stupid argument. Just because something's been copied a billion times doesn't mean it's a more accurate reflection of something that's been copied two or three times. Okay? It's a dumb argument. What well, Mama always used to say, if most people agree that it's a good idea to jump off a bridge, it doesn't make it a good idea. Okay? The majority of Greek manuscripts do agree with the Byzantine text. But most of them are very late copies um, and they de demonstrate the prolific nature of the folks who copied these, the scholars, but it doesn't necessarily attest to the veracity of the text. So striving to get a more accurate text is going to require us to put our thinking cap on and actually try to reflect what would be closer to the original based on certain academic arguments. What would be more reflective of the autographs? It's not a matter of a majority vote. Just because 99 people vote yes to something and one person votes no doesn't mean the person who votes no is wrong. We might end up in the end finding if the person voted no, that one person was correct. Okay, duplication and repetition does not prove accuracy. Okay? Many of the more ancient fragments actually agree with the Alexandrian texts. But we don't accept either one of them 100% of the time anyway. 100% of the reformers would agree that this is not accurate. 100, including the King James Version people who, who translated King James, would tell you that the King James only people are crazy because the Byzantine texts, the King James translators would say that the Byzantine texts are not reflective of the originals. So, I mean, it's just an absolute ignorance. Um, even the Roman Catholic Church, this is another argument by King James only. I, I just saw this the other day. Even Roman Catholics were embarrassed by Codex Sinaiticus, which is an Alexandrian text. Uh, so they buried it, kept it away from people. That, that's so stupid. They had all these libraries. There was a lot of chaos. And I don't know if you're aware, the medieval, medieval times were really tumultuous. Uh, they were struggling with Moorish invasions, invasions of the Arabs, and uh, they were struggling with the bubonic plague, and, and, and they were doing the best that they could. But yes, it's true. Greek scholarship 
You know, they thought, the, the Roman Catholics thought they had the finalized translation of the Bible and Jerome's Latin Vulgate. So they, yeah, they put them away. It's not that they were embarrassed by them. They were like the King James only people, though. They said, we have our translation of the Bible. We don't need to go back and translate the Bible again. They, we have the, the perfect Latin Bible. And so the reformers kind of pushed that issue, but it doesn't mean that the Catholics were hiding it because they were embarrassed. It's just such a dumb argument based on lack of information. The Sinaiticus, which again is an Alleg uh, 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 Alexandrian text, which, is, which they despise, by the way, is the foundation of modern translation. It's Roman Catholic and therefore evil. Well, <laughs> the Byzantine texts were also Roman Catholic, by the way. And their King James Version of the Bible, as we discussed last week, is actually based as much on the Latin Vulgate written by Jerome and accepted by the Roman Catholic Church as it is by the Greek text. So it's just a stupid argument. Contemporary translations are the work of Satan. Look at everything they change. Ah, uh, excuse me. Historically, if you look at the Greek text, the people who changed the Bible were the King James folks. It wasn't the other way around. So more contemporary translations try to go back close to the original, which means that sometimes there's shorter verses and uh, differences, none of which make a whole hill of beans in matters of your salvation. King James folks just are, are authoritarian and want to put you in your place and I don't accept authoritarianism ever. It's just always wrong. So let's go on. We talked last time about an edition that was put into the King James Version of the Bible based upon the Latin Vulgate. I'm going to actually show you some other things that are not in any Greek text. You will not find them in any of the Greek codexes. But they are in the King James Version of the Bible. Where do they get them from? From Latin Vulgate. So these are all different texts. Matthew chapter 6. Um, the codex, unlike the King... The codexes that they were using, and the minuscules that they are using, unlike the King James Version, does not end with a benediction here. That's something that was added. That the King James Version added based upon the Latin Vulgate. Same here. Same here, same here, same here, same here, same here. So again, what the, what the King James only folks who don't realize this open up the King James Version and said, look, this translation got rid of all these. That must be a satanic agenda. It's not a satanic agenda. We are just looking at the Greek text and saying, these are not in the Greek text. They weren't even in the Greek text that the King James people used. It only is found in the Latin Vulgate. So what are you going to do? You're looking at this and you're saying, well, those were additions by the King James Version. It's not subtractions by the contemporary versions. So my claim, oh, my claim is this. Both the Texas Receptus and the Novum Testamentum Grece are faithful witnesses of Jesus Christ. You've heard me say that. King James Onlyism, here's another book about the evils of a uh, King James Only person, the evils of new, new translations. It's called the New Age Translations. That's just crazy. King James Onlyism is making an article faith out of research done by reformers, and in so doing, they demonstrate a lack of trust in the Holy Spirit. There you go. Sorry, I do not accept King James Onlyism. You have a lack of faith in the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. You have a lack of faith in people of God and the direction of the Holy Spirit. And you put way too much trust. You make an idol of a translation of a book when we should only be worshiping Jesus Christ. Yes. So here's my statement about the Bible. I believe in Jesus, as I said. That's all that's necessary for salvation. I don't believe in a translation of the Bible. I don't even believe in the Bible. I believe what the Bible says, but I do not worship the Bible. It's not an idol. Okay? The Bible is a witness of those people of faith who participate in the formative events of our faith, and therefore they're witnesses. They would have an accurate reflection of that. I think we should trust that witness. Okay? The Bible intentionally includes ideas that are in tension with one another because they want to show the variety of faith. There are a lot of Christians who early Christians who didn't agree with each other, and both of those perspectives are often put in the Bible to show that the Bible can contain, and our faith can contain, um, a large swath of information and differences, and it's okay. 
Let me show you an example of concepts that are in tension. I told you the last time that we should not be so quick to harmonize uh, the gospel accounts. And so if you notice, uh, you know, this is a debatable point about the sayings of Q. Some people think Mark is actually Q, and I, I don't want to spend some time with that because you all are just glazing over at this point saying, what are you talking about Q? But there is just, in summary, we believe that there was a, a source that Matthew and Luke used and Mark used uh, to get the statements of Jesus because they, there's such agreement. They're written over, they're written, there's, you know, 40 years or so or more between when each of those books were written. Uh, so probably they each had a book called Q, which we don't have, uh, that they got the quotes from of, of Jesus. Well, chances are Mark was the gospel that Matthew and Luke were using uh, and copying from that. But nevertheless, the point is if you compare the Beatitudes, the uh, with from Luke to Matthew. One says, Luke, blessed are the poor. Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, there, again, harmonization. Well, Jesus preached his message twice, and it's based on two different preachings. Well, that's stupid. Okay, I'm sorry. It's probably based on the same exact, he, he may have preached it multiple times, and but it's probably based on the same hearing of it, but sometimes people hear things differently. So Luke, when he was hearing Jesus say, blessed are the poor, he was hearing the physical, materialistically poor, the people who are starving to get death. Luke, or Matthew, was hearing, blessed are the people who are impoverished spiritually, who don't know how good their relationship with God could be. What's wrong with both of those being in the Bible? I think it's brilliant that the Bible includes these two ideas in tension. These are two different hearings of the same sermon by Jesus, and they both got something different. Here's what's amazing. Conservative Christians need to hear this one. Evangelical Christians. Blessed are the physically poor, because you need to be getting out of your churches and stop contemplating your navels and feed the hungry. This one is for the liberal Christians today who are only thinking about feeding the hungry and they think that's justice and they think that's what spirituality is. You know what? We need to care for that spirit because people are broken in here too. They're both necessary. Don't harmonize them. It's awesome that we have these concepts in tension because they give us a broader understanding. And I think maybe Jesus was trying to tell us both. But one heard this, the other heard the other. We are so blessed to have these ideas and tension to, given to us today. How cool is that? All righty, let's go on. Um, so what translation are we going to use? And this is where I get to my opinion. My opinion, based on what I've presented so far, is that our Bible should be translated from the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text, and the Novum Testamentum Grece, not the Textus Receptus. And that, but that's okay if you want to translate from the Textus Receptus, because as I said, the Textus Receptus is also a faithful witness to Jesus Christ. That when we translate it, we should remain as neutral and literal as we possibly can to the Hebrew and Greek word as possible, although that's not entirely possible because of the structure of Greek and Hebrew in particular. It's very tough. But remember, as I said before, every translation is ultimately an interpretation. Because at some point, there is no direct 100% accurate translation from Hebrew, from a Hebrew word or concept in English. You have to play around with the words, and sometimes there's discrepancy words, and sometimes a word can mean multiple things, and maybe this guy chooses this word, and maybe that guy chooses another word because they think it reflects something else. So you're translating it. <clears throat> it's one step away from the original. There's always an interpretation, always an interpretation that's being made in every translation. There's no translation that can ever possibly be completely accurate. So what is interpretation? Let me tell you this, because I know sometimes what people today will do will say, well, that's your interpretation. 
they, they mean something entirely different, by the way. Interpretation is an academic process. It studies the words, the structure, the literary style. That's what interpretation is. It's not about meaning. It's about interpreting. It's about that process. It's a scientific process of taking the words, the structure, and the style and trying to try and interpret as accurately as we can to convey the original meaning. The interpretation, however, cannot be fixed. And there's a reason. In other words, we can't say, okay, I've interpreted, therefore it's 100% accurate. Well, we can because we're continually learning something new about the text. I mean, you remember maybe uh, 20 years ago, uh, I, I don't know when this was, but I remember hearing it in seminary and so forth when I first went and got my MDiv. And, you know, talking about Jesus talking about the rich. It's easier for a rich person to, to uh, it's easier for the, a camel to go through an eye of needle than for a rich person to go to heaven. And then there's a big debate. Well, what's the eye of the needle? Is that the, the, the rope on the tent that, uh, and that the, you know, that's really hard for a camel to get through? Or were there actual needles? We actually found some needles with eye holes that date all the way back then. So was, what was he talking about? Well, we're learning, okay? All right, interpretation cannot be fixed because we don't always know what everything means. So we cannot interpret, therefore, the Bible in any way that we want to. Interpretation just can't be your interpretation, my interpretation. We need to argue based on the words, the structure, the style. And so there may be a range of differences between interpretations because I might interpret this word this way. You might interpret it as this meaning of that word. It's like the word gay. If I said the word gay, what would you think I'm saying? What's your interpretation? Well, if you're probably somebody 80 or 90, maybe you're thinking, well, that's somebody who's happy. If you're somebody who's 50 or under, you're probably thinking, oh, that's somebody who's a homosexual. Okay. So there's a range of interpretations there. Well, what's the context? Well, maybe it's a document that was written in the 1600s. He was a gay man. Then all of a sudden that transforms your interpretation. He must have been a happy man. Or, I understand the word gay at that time, somebody who's carefree and somebody who was actually not uh, uh, responsible. Depending on when the word gay was being used. Okay? So you have to argue based on the words, the structure, the style. There's only a certain range of meaning something can mean. You can only interpret things. You can't make things mean what you want them to mean. You have to argue for them academically. So I'm here to tell you, you might be eyeing this right now. I hope you are. An atheist and a Christian will have the same range of interpretation of the Bible. I know many atheistic scholars of the Bible who come up with the same interpretation as I do. Because interpretation is not something that's inspired by God. Interpretation is something, again, an academic process based on the words, the structure, and style of literature. They will make, an atheistic scholar will make the same conclusions about how to interpret the Bible as long as we have in our hands the same exact pieces of information. So that's interpretation. What we often mean, however, when we say interpretation, is meaning. Now that is a little more personal. But let's not confuse interpretation with meaning. We often conflate interpretation with meaning. Meaning is always rooted, however, in the interpretation. So we have a range of interpretations that this word can mean, uh, uh, a range of interpretation for that word. But what it means to us is something different. You know, I can read a play by Shakespeare or something. It might mean something to me, and it might not mean anything to you. We might come to some interpretation of what Shakespeare is trying to tell us in that sonnet, but it might not mean a thing to you because it just doesn't speak to you. That's different, though. I think sometimes we conflate interpretation with meaning. Meaning is contextual, i.e., i.e., what is the Spirit trying to tell me? So I might read the same passage, we might come to the same interpretation, but the Spirit might lead a meaning in my life that transforms my life in a way 
that's, that, that's powerful but may not be in your, your life. So, for instance, I used this the other day, last week, about Luther. Luther couldn't stand the book of James. He thought it was a gospel of straw. There was no nourishing content in it. And a lot of people get really angry with that. I can't believe Luther. He was wrong. No, Luther wasn't wrong. It's about meaning. Luther did not get any meaning out of James. And a lot of that was contextual. Because it sounded a lot like the very type of heresies that he was combating against in the church of his day. So he didn't hear it. It wasn't meaningful to him. I'm not critical of him for that. It might mean everything to you. Meaning is going to be contextual. What the Bible means is where atheists and Christians part ways. We will come to the same interpretations as long as we have the same information. But when we understand what the Bible means to us, if it means something to us, atheists are going to say, the Bible doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> Christian will say, ah, it's so meaningful, it's transforming my life. Okay, so I want you to make sure you don't conflate those two things. Now, with that in mind, there are multiple theories of how the Bible is to be translated. And you notice all the way over here is an interlinear Bible. If you've ever seen an interlinear Bible, you probably don't understand. Unless, unless you understand Greek and Hebrew, an interlinear Bible is going to be gibberish. Okay? It's a word-for-word -word translation. But remember, every translation is an interpretation. It's still an interpretation, but it tries to be word-for-word. -word. The problem with a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible is that it's gibberish because their sentence structure is so different than ours. All right? So we come up with this concept of word for word. We get as word for word as we possibly can. You'll notice there's, you can actually see this later. I'm going to post these uh, documents for you. But it shows that uh, there are many translations try to be as close to word for word as possible as much as English will allow us to between the Greek and the Hebrew. But then you get kind of right in the middle ground. Notice right there in the middle is the NIV. And then we have thought for thought and you get more, and then ultimately to uh, paraphrases, the message and so forth, and some of these types of things. But, um, so there's, there's three different types of translations. So let's take a look at these. First of all, and these are translation theories, the literal translation. The literal translation, as I said, is where you try to keep as close as possible to a word-for-word -word translation. The problem that we have is that we don't always know what every single word means and we're still learning. That's what I indicated to you about the eye of the needle. Uh, we also have these things called hapex legomenons in the Bible. Words that are only used once. We don't see them anywhere else. To understand a word, we need to see its context in multiple places. This is where we get into an interesting thing in the Bible. In the King James translation of the Bible, it's kind of funny. And I give the King James people credit for this. Uh, are there unicorns in the Bible? Well, if you read the King James version of the Bible, there certainly are. I think, what, there's like eight to ten different passages that mentions unicorn in the Bible. Um, <coughs> you can look it up if you'd like. I'm not going to go into those. And I actually have folks say, see, the Bible says there were unicorns. No, the King James translation of the Bible says there were unicorns. But that's because they ran across a word that they didn't understand how to translate. They knew it was a creature with a single horn. They knew it was a mythical creature with a single horn. And you're, uh, in, your, you're in England in the 1600s. What's the mythical creature with a single horn that you think of? A unicorn. But that's not what you think of if you're a Jew. If you're a Jew, guess what it is? A rhinoceros. They wouldn't have had any understanding of this. They were seeing more of a rhinoceros, a big beastly animal. And so therefore, this is really a wrong translation. Because honestly, the animal that the Bible was trying to communicate is a vicious, tough, beastly creature. I give credit for the King James Version for trying to at least come up with some type of image of a mythical single-horned creature. But this doesn't state that there was unicorns. It's just an interpretation based on the information we have. We have better information now than we did back then. So um, 
That is obviously not an accurate translation. <laughs> Alone, let's go on. Um, our, unfortunately, also, so um, I have no clue where I'm at. There we go. We don't always, like I said, know what the words mean. As I mentioned to you, unicorn. Um, there are some uh, versions that attempt to be as literal as possible. There you go. That's what this is. That's what I'm doing. The interlinear, as I said, you wouldn't understand it. If you don't understand Greek and Hebrew, don't waste your time on an interlinear, um, interlinear Bible. It's meant for people who've got some education in Greek and Hebrew and at least understand how the structure, sense structure of Greek and Hebrew. Otherwise, it's going to be gibberish to you. But the New American Standard, English Standard, <clears throat> the King James Version, and the Revised Standard Version, but that's on the border. We're going to come back to that in a bit. So, uh, oh, look, the King James Version made it there. I'm going to give you a little hint. I prefer literal translations, as literal as possible. So the Bible I like to read is on this list. But it's not this one. Let's go on. Another type of translation theory, translating from Greek and Hebrew into English, is the dynamic equivalence theory. And, you know, these are are false dichotomies in the sense that uh, it's not like a translator says, I'm going to choose this style. They try to combine them sometimes, and as I said with the RSV, you're going to see it's kind of a mixture between two. But the dynamic equivalency, they use contemporary idioms and language to convey ideas. The problem with using contemporary idioms when you're translating the Bible is contemporary is ultimately only contemporary temporarily. Does that make sense? Contemporary is only temporary, contemporary temporarily. Um, it changes its meaning as soon as you translate it into that contemporary idiom. That usage of that, that contemporary idiom changes before that book is even released. And, oh, by the way, it's not even the same all across the country. So we might have a contemporary idiom that we use here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, like yin's. I hate that word, but that actually it's not bad. It actually does something that English language does not do well, and that's the plural, second person plural, that we don't have in English. We just have you. Well, are you saying singular you or plural you? Yens actually clearly indicates that you're, you're, you're using second person plural, right? So yens, I don't like it, but actually it's actually not bad communicating an image. Um, so... Uh, when we think about language and the use of these contemporary idioms, as soon as you use a contemporary idiom like yins, it might speak to somebody in Allegheny County in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but somebody in California is going to say, what the heck is yins? Okay? What is that? That's the problem with contemporary idioms. They don't always speak as clearly to everybody, and they change meaning very quickly. So the problem then becomes with contemporary translations that are based on dynamic equivalency, sometimes they get so old that we need to start translating the translation. We need to interpret the translation. That's bad. It's not a bit, they, 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 their shelf life is very short, and they should be. Unfortunately, we continue to use a lot of dynamic equivalent uh, translations long after their shelf life is gone. Good example, the New International Version, its shelf life is well worn, it's gone. I, you know, I like the NIV in some places. The Old Testament is excellent. The Old Testament is a little bit iffy in some places. But it is so old at this point that the idioms that it's trying to use to communicate things don't mean the same. This is 1970s and 1980s. They don't mean the same in 2020. Okay? Uh, the CEV, the Contemporary English Translation, the New American Bible, the New Century Version, today's English Version, what we call the Good News. So these are dynamic equivalencies. Like I said, if it's over 10 years of age, pitch it. Get a new translation of the Bible, because these date very quickly. Going on, paraphrases. Huh. I'm not against paraphrases in certain contexts. Paraphrase, though, is not, is not a translation. They are the imposition of someone's meaning that they find in the Bible. Usually what it is is somebody, it, most paraphrases, somebody's picking up an English translation of the Bible and saying, oh, okay, well, this is, this is the meaning I get out of it. And so they start writing the Bible in their own words. 
That's actually a very useful devotional purpose. I, I like that for devotional purposes, but um, there's limited meaning to it because you're one step even further away from the meaning of the Bible. Accuracy is not the point with a paraphrase. And remember, when you are reading a paraphrase, you are not reading the Bible. You're not reading an interpretation of the Bible. You're reading the meaning that somebody finds in an interpretation of the Bible. See how far away you're getting from the Bible, the paraphrase? It's not bad as long as you understand its limitations. You're reading somebody's devotional reflection upon the Bible. What are some of, the, uh, what are some of these Bibles? Um, here's some good paraph paraphrases. The Message. Uh, I, I know a lot of Christians have been reading the message recently. Um, the Living Bible, New Living Translation. However, to a point, okay? To a point. There's actually, um, the New Living Translation is, is, is a paraphrase of Greek and Hebrew. So this is actually a much better paraphrase than these other ones. Because at least it's based on Greek and Hebrew. The voice. So those are different translations. So, you probably have gathered right now, as I've told you, uh, you probably are focusing in on which translation I'm using. What, do I do what translations have biases? Well, before we get there, I, I want to start with this. Do translations have biases? This is a problem. Because they all do. Uh, yes, even the beloved King James Version of the Bible has a bias. What? Are you kidding me? The King James Version, King James actually demanded that when the committee translated the Bible, that it support his authority as the King of England. He was concerned about the Puritans and the rebellion against the Church of England, and so he wanted to make sure that that was included in the translation. So you better believe, you may not be able to identify it, but you better believe that that bias was built into the 1611 translation of the Bible. Uh, the new RSV, and this is why I said the RSV is a literal translation to a point. One of the things that they're really concerned about the new RSV is gender neutrality. Uh, they knew that they were being used as a lectionary Bible, and they took this into consideration. And so they tried to get rid of a lot of the, the gender-specific language, you know, son, uh, men, those types of things. In some cases, that's actually okay. But there are other cases where the Bible uses the word son, and it very specifically has a theological purpose for the use of the word son that isn't accurately understood when you say sons and daughters or children. So um, you have to be aware of these things when you use the RSV. Because again, this is the bias built in the King James. Be aware of it. This is the bias built in the new RSV. There's also, also anti-female biases built into many translations of the Bible. This may be a great secret, I don't know, but there are a lot of men who've controlled the transmission of the Bible through the years, and they like to make sure that women have no part in it. Uh, anti-female bias. It's been with us for thousands of years. And men continue to try to control and manipulate the scripture in a way that reflects their biases to keep women in their place. Uh, we do have some really good translations of the Bible that fail sometimes because of their anti-female bias in a particular passage. And let me use one example. Case of Ephesians uh, 5. This is, this is my copy of the NIV, by the way. Um, anybody who's been with me in marriage counseling knows that I do this every single time I pull out the, uh, uh, the and I, or when I pull out this passage, I'm, I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 5. This drives me crazy! Um, this is, the thing that I scratched out here is not biblical. It's a title put over top of this passage of scripture. And so what the NIV has done, a very anti-female bias, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. New idea! Wives, submit to your husbands as the Lord. This is an anti-female bias. This verse goes with verse 21. It makes a huge difference. A lot of translations do this. In fact, notice I do scratch out one of the words in the Bible, the word submit here. Wives, submit. I scratch the word submit. 
because that word is not in the Greek text. There is no verb in verse 22 in the Greek text. Why? Because verse 22 gets its verb from verse 21. Why does this make a difference? Why am I making such a big point about this? Because... Submit to one or out of the reverence of Christ. If you just hear that phrase, you say, well, that means everybody. That means me. I'm supposed to submit to you. I am. That means you. You're supposed to submit to me. Yes. That means a wife is supposed to submit to her husband. Yes. That means a husband is supposed to submit to her, her man. Yeah. A husband is supposed to submit to her wife. His wife. Yes. All of those would be true and contained in that idea. And then Paul is going to list for us all the people that are supposed to submit to each other. Now, Everybody hears this. Paul says this. Submit to one another. It's a very rabbinic way of arguing. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Everybody say, okay. Wives to your husband. No verb there. Wives to your husbands. Implied by this. And every man in Jewish culture and, and, and that Paul was writing to was saying, yeah, Paul, put those women in their place. But notice again, he didn't put the word submit in there. And then he goes on to the next verse, the next concept. Wives to your husbands, husbands agape. Husbands love your wives. Well, see, here's how these translations do it. Wives submit to your husbands. Husbands just coddle and care for your wives. No, Paul uses the most radical word for submission that he can possibly use, agapeo. In order to demonstrate to these bigoted, anti-female men that not only are wives supposed to submit to their husbands, but wives, husbands are to radically submit to their wives, even the point of giving their lives for them. And then all of a sudden, mind blown. All the men are like, you got to be kidding me, Paul. My wife is nothing but cattle. No. She's the person that you're supposed to give your life for. That's how much you're supposed to submit to her. Yeah, so it makes a difference. This is an anti-female bias. Translating the Bible that's not actually in the Greek text. Versions that include this and express this bias, the King, King James Version. One of the things that King James gets wrong. The NIV gets it wrong. The New American Standard Version gets it wrong. Okay? There are versions that get it right. The RSV, that's not a surprise, because again, they're trying to get rid of that gender bias in their RSV. Uh, the NCV, the NAB, the NLT. The NLT, which again is a paraphrase based on the Greek and Hebrew. They get it right. So does the message. The message gets it right. That's a paraphrase. They, they do a better job of translating that than King James and the NIV do. But that's one case. Uh, so that's another bias. There's another bias that's written into this. Money. <coughs> <coughs> Christian capital, Christian publishing houses are capitalists, uh, capitalistic. Bible sales are four hundred and twenty-five million dollar a year business in the United States. So you better believe there's a lot of pressure. That's according to again 2017. 2017. I don't know what it was in 2019, but in other ways, nevertheless, there is fierce competition to sell your Bible translation over somebody else's. The King James Version is not excluded in this. Where do you think this phrase, the authorized version, came from? It came from the publishers who saw all these other English translations competing against theirs, and so they figured they could get, uh, get uh, their corner of the market by calling themselves the authorized version. It worked for 400 years until people got tired of it and said, you know, we can, we can do better than King James. And so we just kind of looked at this and realized the word authorized version was such a cynical attempt by the publishers to try to tell everybody we're the right translation because we're authorized. We give the impression that we're authorized by God. It's authorized by King James. It certainly wasn't authorized by God. It's a marketing gimmick, for goodness sakes. So yes, money is an influence on our Bible. But here's the good news. Jesus is still faithfully proclaimed. How amazing is that? Jesus Christ overcomes our cynical endeavors to market our Bibles, our anti-feminist, our anti-female and anti-feminist tendencies. He overcomes those things too. How amazing is that? So which translation do I use? Oh, let me see. 
for Bible study, if I'm studying the scripture for a sermon, almost exclusively the New American Standard Version of the Bible. It is one of the literal translations of the Bible. But this was a darn good Bible too. The English Standard Bible, they are really good literal translations of the Bible that will stand the test of time compared to those that depend upon dynamic equivalencies or idiomatic phrases. Um, they're both translated from the Masoretic text and the Novum Testament of Great Jake. Now you notice that when we're talking about anti-female bias, I said the New American Standard had some of that anti-female bias built into it. But I still like it. But I'm aware that some of these things are in that text. There's always mistakes and problems in every translation. Now, if unavailable, I will use the RSV. But I understand that they've got this gender neutrality bias built into it. And then followed by the King James. I do use the King James. I have a great deal of respect for it. But again, I believe it should be my translation I prefer is the Novum Testament Great J. I have to make sure that there are passages in the scripture which ones are not actually in the Greek text, which ones did the King James Version Bible transport from the, uh, from the Latin Vulgate. And so those are things I'm aware of. You may not be. But if you use the King James Version, I, I prefer you use one of these translations. New American Standard, English Standard, uh, RSV, King James Version. You use one of those, you're using one of the little translations of the Bible, good on you. You are closer to the original than some of the other copies. Now, that said, for worship, almost exclusively the NRSV. I do preach from the New American Standard. But in worship, because our worship booklets are made out of, uh, from the new RSV, that's what I use. But, you know, the 23rd Psalm, Lord's Prayer, how can you do anything but read the King James Version? Even though the King James Version acts, a, 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 adds the doxology at the end of the Lord's Prayer, we're so used to that. It's actually, the King James has actually transformed the way we pray the Lord's Prayer. Because the doxology was not in the Lord's Prayer. If you've ever been to a Roman Catholic church, and you're praying along, and all of a sudden, you're, uh, for thine is the kingdom, the power of the glory forever and ever. And the Lord's Prayer, and everybody's looking at you and you say, oh, it's one of those Protestants. Because, you know, they don't have that at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, that's because it's not in the Greek texts. texts. But it's something that the, the King James was so influential in our understanding of the Lord's Prayer. That it's in everybody's version now. That's okay. It's faithful. It doesn't matter whether it was original, it was something that was passed on to us from the Latin Vulgate and ultimately here, and it's faithful to, to God's will for us. And, and these are just so beautiful, the 23rd Psalm, Lord's Prayer. Although I'll tell you, the 23rd Psalm, you read in Hebrew, it does read a lot different than it does in the King James. I think the King James got some things wrong but with the 23rd Psalm, but the sentiment is right. And so I love it. The New American Standard, as I said, for sermon, sermon preparation, along with the Hebrew and the Greek, I'll put them out there and I'll read them together. And uh, that's what I like to do. For devotional use, I'll read any translation. Depends. Ask me on the day. I don't know. Right now, I guess for devotional purposes, I've been reading probably the last couple of years a New Living Translation. I really like it. Um, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a good paraphrase. Uh, based on the Greek and the Hebrew. I think they've done a really faithful job. But I wouldn't depend upon it for preaching uh, or for making a theological point, but I really enjoy the New Living Translation. I, it inspires me. Um, I do have a bias against the NIV. Uh, that's a personal bias. One of my uh, college professors was, uh, who taught me Greek was actually on the NIV New Testament committee and he hated the process. It was so political. It was, uh, and um, he ended up asking his name to be removed from the translating committee, and he just left, because he said he just couldn't take it. And, uh, and so I obviously have those biases. You know, fighting for my professor. My professor's dead. He's been dead for 30 years, probably now, 40 years, whatever. But uh, I'm still fighting the battle. I believed in him. You know, he's a great guy. And, um, so I, I, that doesn't mean I do use the NIV on occasion, because it's there but it's certainly not one of my favorite ones. For children's programming, I use the New Living Translation again. I think it's great. I think it's good to inspire kids because it, it does communicate it in a way that's handleable and understandable for kids. 
Um, this is not, this is only the beginning of their education of faith. They're not going to remember that when they're 30, 40 years of age. You're going to be able to catch them up on the biblical scholarship later. My most important thing with children's education in Sunday school is it's all about getting children together in an environment where they get excited about Jesus. And I think the New Living Translation is a really good help with that. And so that's why I use it. I'm fine if other people use other things. It's just what I use. I found it very useful for that. So let me just end with this. I don't care which translation Bible we use. Just be aware that everyone has its problems and everyone has its strong points. If you're reading a paraphrase, understand it's a paraphrase. If you're reading something that's a dynamic equivalency, understand that, that they can become dated. Don't make your faith based solely on a translation of the Bible. Consult multiple examples. Consult a literal translation of the Bible with a paraphrase and see how they say it differently. And the devotional thing that maybe that person got off it. I'm encouraging you to open your mind. I mean, you're never probably going to be able to read in Greek and Hebrew, and that's okay. We're here to help you with that. But I'm going to also leave you with this. The most important thing is realize that the Holy Spirit is at work. If you're reading the King James Version of the Bible, God is speaking to you. If you are reading the NIV, I don't like the NIV, but guess what? God is faithful and is speaking to you. If you're reading the message, even though it's a paraphrase, God can still speak to you through that author's work. Because God overcomes all things. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe in a translation of the Bible. I don't even believe in the Bible. I believe in Jesus. And I believe that Jesus is accurately communicated through the Bible, even despite the humanness of the translations and the mistakes that we have made. How spectacular a God is that? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to be here today, for what we've learned over these last few weeks, and we ask you to inspire us with your presence. Let us know that you speak to us through your word, for we give you thanks in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If you would like to post some of your questions, some of your disagreements, some of your questions, corrections on the Facebook page, advertisement for this, you're welcome to do so. I may try to come back with a fourth session addressing some of the questions with my Mia Culpas. Yeah, I misspoke there because you know sometimes you're speaking and you misspeak some things. I didn't communicate it accurately. It was misunderstood. That's my fault. That's on me. That's why I never tell people to believe in me. Don't believe in me. Believe in Jesus. Okay? I do the best job I can communicating this information. I've made mistakes. So, you're welcome to ask me about them. Be kind. All right, don't be a jerk. All right, I'm trying not to be a jerk to anybody here. Let's be kind to one another and just come back and say, look, I'm not sure I agree with that. This is what I was thinking. What do you think about this? Well, this is what I use. What do you think? Or, you know, I, I, I think your history was a little bit off here. This is what, what happened. Okay, tell me that. And we'll come back and address it and I'll like I said, I'll do my mea culpa is where I'm wrong. I'll clarify where I was right, but I just misspoke and was inaccurate. Or uh, it's just crazy how I said something and it just distracted from our time. Please write those concerns to me. Like I said, we'll come back. We'll do a fourth time together. I'll answer those questions. Maybe we can even have a live audience. Wouldn't that be spectacular? So thank you for joining us. God's blessing to you. Go be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be transformed by the Word of God. Amen.